<laughs> Welcome to all you guys. Thank you so much for, for coming tonight. Uh, first of all, how many of you guys have already had heart surgery? One. Just two. And how many are about to have heart surgery or think they might have surgery? One. Okay. All right. So you guys have a you have a keen interest then, but uh, uh, hopefully we have enough information in here that everybody can get a little bit out of it. What I wanted to talk about tonight was uh, minimally invasive cardiac surgery. And uh, of course, you know everything in surgery nowadays uh, it refers to minimally invasive. Uh, going back to I guess people most most familiar with it originally from orthopedic surgery, from arthroscopic surgery, and then we had the laparoscopic gallbladders, and and then we were doing thoracoscopic surgery for lung lung resections, and then finally uh, cardiac surgery in the uh, early 1990s hit the minimally invasive uh, route. And since that time, we've been working on various techniques to, to make the surgery less and less invasive. And, but when we talk about minimally invasive cardiac surgery, I think it, it, it really needs to, to be defined because you'll hear a lot of things called minimally invasive, but for something to be truly minimally invasive, it's got to minimize, oops, I'm sorry, it's got to minimize intraoperative trauma, minimize post-operative complications, cosmetic deformity, but still has got to offer equal or superior results to traditional surgery. So if it's going to be valuable, it really, to be ideal, it has to accomplish all those goals. And of course the question is, does that exist? And the answer, as you could guess, is not yet. I mean, we have a lot of minimally invasive approaches, but none of them are characterized by this ideal minimally invasive procedure yet. That's what we're that's what we're heading towards. And so, what do we mean when we talk about invasiveness? Well, of course, as lay people, you probably the first thing you think of when we talk about invasive is a cut. Yeah. So, a big old cut on you somewhere is invasive. And a lot of people stop right there in terms of thinking about what what's being invaded with their body. But really, there's there are other things uh, that that are that are invasive as well that need to be taken into consideration when you're looking at these various procedures. When you go to uh, when you have a heart operation, I'm getting used to this. She just gave me this thing after the meeting. I'm only a heart surgeon. I don't know exactly. When cannulation that means the tubes and pipes we put in inside the, the, the heart to put people on the heart lung machine is invasive. We're putting things in parts of the body that aren't supposed to be poked around with. And then cardiopulmonary bypass itself, being on the heart and lung machine, it's invasive, and we'll talk about why. And then going under general anesthesia. I mean, they put in lines, they, they give you all types of drugs, that's invading parts of your body that, that really aren't, aren't meant to be tampered with. But if you look at cardiac surgery as a whole, in general, surgery is great because it can restore function, it can save lives in a predictable and sustained fashion with a remarkably low incidence of complications despite all of these invasions that, that we have. So what are potential major complications? Even though they're rare, there are some bad things that can happen. And those include bleeding, which is usually something that can easy to be taken care of, but not always. Uh, infection, heart attacks, strokes, problems with memory and thinking, uh, you can have blood vessels in the legs or the arms, other places get, get blocked off, even blood vessels to the, to the intestines. You can have kidneys fail, the lungs can fail, and of course you could have death in some cases. Now this is a, this is a busy side, but I'm going to walk you through it and, and explain to you why I got this. Up here are the things that we talked about, down on it, up here are the things that we talked about that are invasive, the incision, cannulation, bypass, and anesthetic. And with each one of those, these lines are going to go to the various potential complications that can occur. And we talked about all these complications, bleeding, stroke, occlusion, pulmonary failure, infection, and even death. And what I want you to notice is that if you look at all of these invasive things that we do and what the potential negative consequences are, the thing that has the most lines coming from it to the most major complications is getting put on the heart lung machine. Okay? Look at incision. This is what we all worry about, right? It's incision. 
But in terms of major complications, incision, you know, if you change incision, you can affect the risk of bleeding, which as I told you before, most of the time we can handle, or infection. None of the rest of these things have anything to do with the incision, okay? But what the average person thinks about, they think about post-operative pain. That's a, big, that's a big issue for people. They don't want to be in pain. A lot of people want to get back to work early. And a lot of people worry about the cosmetics. And so then you're back to the incision. That's, that's what people see on the outside, and, and that's what catches their attention. So the standard cardiac surgery approach that was developed in around 1953, 1954 by a surgeon named Julian was to go down the middle of the chest. For years before that, everybody went between the ribs if they did anything like any type of cardiac or lung procedure. But he finally discovered that you could actually split the bone down the middle and get to the heart. And it was a wonderful thing because it allowed surgeons to have access to all the important things that were necessary to save people's lives back then. But nowadays, we're, we're going backwards in order to go forward. And that is, let's say, what other ways can we get into the chest and still accomplish the goal? And there's plenty of ways. You can divide the, the, the uh, sternum partially instead of going completely down. You can make a, a cut in the, in the front of the chest. You can make a cut on the, last, on, the, on, the, on the lateral side of the chest. You can make a cut right down beneath the uh, xiphoid process, right, right in the upper abdomen. You can use uh, scopes and cameras and, and uh, long instruments to go through the chest. And nowadays, uh, we're even using robots to, to get in into the chest. But the limited access incisions have advantages and disadvantages. The obvious advantages we talked about are uh, cosmetic, where you don't have as big an incision, you don't divide the bone, so there's minimal bone injury, and there's a potential uh, in some of these incisions for a faster recovery in terms of the, uh, the incision itself. But the disadvantages are here. First of all, the surgeon in any of these approaches generally has the, uh, a, a lesser access to the important structures. So if things get, do go badly, you've got a little bit harder time to get in there to do things than you do if you've got you know, ample exposure. There are some situations where I don't care what type of minimally invasive approach you're familiar with, you can't, you can't use it in those types of situations. And most of these minimally invasive incisions, the heart and lung machine time is longer than in a wide open chest. As you can imagine, if you operate through a little keyhole, it's going to take a little bit longer. It's like making the ship in the bottle as opposed to just making the ship out in the open. It takes a little longer to do that. And then in some of the incisions, some people actually, it's a little bit more painful. Uh, when you go between the ribs, it can be more painful, but generally it's only initially more painful. And then people recover more quickly and, uh, and are able to get to, to work better because they don't have, faster because they don't have to worry about bone healing. So cardiopulmonary bypass, we've mentioned all the problems that can be associated with that. And uh, for those who aren't familiar, this is sort of a diagrammatic example of cardiopulmonary bypass. Basically tubes are placed in the right side of the heart to drain blood out into uh, an instrument or, or a, uh, what we call an oxygenator that gives oxygen to the blood. So that's the, the lung part of the heart lung machine. And then it pumps the blood back into the arterial system so that it can go to all the vital organs, the brain, etc. And so that's the basic schema behind uh, cardiopulmonary bypass. But cardiopulmonary bypass, as I told you, is one of those big bugaboos in terms of invasion that has a lot of potential uh, risk to it. And those include uh, the general inflammatory response that the body experiences. When somebody goes on a heart and lung machine, the body experiences something very similar to what people experience when they have major trauma. And there's a general, generalized inflammatory response that you can do biochemical markers on to detect. And, and, and a lot of other uh, measurements will, will uh, demonstrate this response. The kidneys sometimes don't like being on the heart lung machine, particularly if the kidneys are abnormal to begin with. If you've got bad lungs, the lungs get, tend to get uh, extra fluid on the heart lung machine, and it can result in problems at the surgery uh, for recovery. And then, of course, there's the risk of bleeding, and that's because the platelets, or the blood cells in the body that help the blood clot, as it goes through the machine and it, and it, and it attaches to these various surfaces, it can set those uh, platelets 
into action before they really are needed, and consequently after surgery, uh, they aren't able to, to do their job. And then you can retain fluid, uh, people can have strokes, and you can have some uh, uh, mental changes. Now, you know, these big bad things, I, I, I will remind you, you know, they're, they're rare for these to be a problem, but that is inherent potential problem anytime you go on a heart lung machine. And because of that, back in 1994, uh, we began doing what's called minimally invasive direct coronary artery bypass surgery here in, in, at St. Joseph's. We were the first people in the north of Seattle to do this procedure. And uh, we did that with the idea that instead of doing standard bypass surgery, going on the heart and lung machine, a technique was developed by a guy named Subramanian in uh, New York to do the bypass graft of a single vessel to the vessel in the front of the heart on the heart while it was still beating without going on the heart lung machine. And this is a diagram where the person's head, head would be up here and their feet would be down here. And this is an incision uh, in the chest wall in the left side of the chest right here between the ribs. And this little rudimentary fork looks like a tuning fork that's, that's bent would stabilize the heart right over that artery while the rest of the heart was beating and allow us to do a mammary artery bypass using an artery that runs along the back side of the sternum. We dissect it off the back side of the sternum and then attach it to there. And we could do that uh, without going on a heart lung machine. And I really was interested in that because I was, I was really, uh, my primary motivation was to try to decrease the risk for strokes that were associated with being on a heart lung machine. And one of the most devastating things for a heart surgeon to experience, not to mention the patient, is to have a, a good heart operation where you know, everything goes great and then have the person uh, experience a stroke. And we knew that one of the major risk factors for stroke was being on a heart lung machine, so I figured if we could eliminate that, then we should be able to, to decrease the risk of, of stroke. This, this paper came out in, uh, in the Bellingham Herald uh, back in 2000, I believe it was, yeah, and it was uh, a study that was done by one of my uh, colleagues, former colleagues at Duke, an anesthesiologist, and he looked at people's mental faculties after surgery, and he saw that after bypass surgery, 40% of the patients showed a 20% drop in their mental capabilities, but that was in the first month after surgery. Now, this caught a lot of national attention as so many studies that are frightening like that do. Well, as time went by, what we learned is that a lot of people who never had heart surgery, if you studied them over that period of time, if they had similar types of vascular disease, would show a drop during that period of time. And we found that a lot of people who just had general anesthesia that never had a heart operation had a similar type drop. But there still was a percentage of these people that had a drop in mental ability that was associated with the heart lung machine. Now, with time, we found out that within 30 to 60 days, they were back to baseline, unless they had an actual stroke. But this was enough to get people very hyper about coronary bypass surgery and, and trying to figure out ways to, to get rid of the heart lung machine. As I say, over time, those concerns lessened as more and more data began to show that it wasn't nearly as bad as, as uh, suggested by that, by that study. 